How do you one, how does one succeed after such worship and such a thrilling number of voices? Just one comment. I know all the voices represented what it'll be like in heaven, but there was no Indian voice there. <laughs> and the reason is we're going to be in the kitchen in heaven. <laughs> the food is going to, the cuisine is going to be Indian, and that'll clear up any congestion, and we'll all be singing out there. Not only does one have the challenge of continuing, but where does one begin? How do you start with a subject like I have on hand within the time and the constraints legitimately of what we have before us? You know, the Irish have a very convoluted way of saying things. I don't know if you've ever been there. Uh, most of the world will say, how are you or how do you do? The Irish will say, is that yourself? You have to ponder and ask yourself, which of myself is he seeing right now? <laughs> but the story is told of this man who was lost, driving along all this beautiful countryside, but he didn't know where he was. So he sees this farmer working the fields, and he stops and asks for directions. And the Irish farmer says, if that's where you are going, this is not where I would begin. <laughs> In other words, you are so far off the mark, buddy, you better retrace your steps before you even start heading in the right direction. Sometimes I think culturally we reach that mark. You know, where do we begin? How do we start the change? I remember being with Malcolm Muggeridge just about nine months before he died. The year was 1990. He passed away towards the end of the year. I think he, at the age of 83, the great British journalist whom I think was the greatest journalist of the 20th century, toss up between him and G.K. Chesterton. Muggeridge said this in the 70s, it is difficult to resist the conclusion that 20th century man has decided to abolish himself. Tired of the struggle to be himself, he has created boredom out of his own affluence, impotence out of his own erotomania, and vulnerability out of his own strength. He himself blows the trumpet that brings the walls of his own cities crashing down until at last, having educated himself into imbecility, having drugged and polluted himself into stupefaction, he keels over a weary, battered old brontosaurus and becomes extinct. Forty years ago, Muggeridge had that insight, and I had just a few hours with him in his home in England because I'd read just about everything he'd written, and I don't know if anybody could turn a phrase better than Muggeridge, whose word choice was so excellent, where he always chose that best word to trigger the emotion that he wanted engendered in what he said. But Muggeridge's departure from Edinburgh University was not a happy one. He was chaplain at that time, of course, one-time journalist and uh, editor of Punch magazine and so on, when he left Edinburgh University, he left it, left, left it over a controversial issue. It was a moral and ethical choice that the university leadership was making. And Muggeridge resigned. He was a latecomer to Christ. And in his farewell address, he said this, so dear Edinburgh students, this may well be the last time I address you, and this is what I want to say to you. And I don't really care whether it means anything to you or not. And whether you think that there is anything in it or not, I want you to believe that this row I have had with your elected officers has nothing to do with any puritanical attitudes on my part. I have no belief in abstinence for abstinence's own sake, no wish under any circumstances to check any fulfillment of your life and your being. But I have to say to you this, that whatever life is or is not about, it is not to be expressed in terms of drug stupefaction, and casual sexual relations. However else we may venture into the unknown, it is not, I assure you, on the plastic wings of Playboy magazine or psychedelic fancies. However we go into the future, I can assure you, it's not going to be on the wings of unbridled hedonism and mind-disorienting ingestions or whatever it is we consume to take us away from reality. This cultural tidal wave that began somewhere in the 60s and now 50 years later has 
ridden to a, a, a crescendo that you and I find so daunting that the more and more strange the reaction we now see from powers that be, pause and say, how did we ever get here? What were the stepping stones that brought us to this point of such an audacious, anti-sacred state of mind? The desacralizing of everything. The profanation of everything. Make it commonplace. The walls have come crumbling down. Chesterton said, whenever you put up a wall, or whenever you pull down a wall, always pause long enough to ask why it was put there in the first place. Whenever you pull down a fence, always pause long enough to ask why was it put there in the first place. In the mid-400s before Christ, there was a man in a Persian palace. His name was Nehemiah. He was a civil engineer. He was not a, an instructor in theology. Unlike Ezra, who was a priest, Nehemiah was a civil engineer. And he was placed in this unique position of trust. Think about it. He was really an exile. But the monarch had him taste the food before he would consume it. Such a man of impeccable character was Nehemiah. And I want to read for you just eight verses from chapter 2. Because in chapter 1, his brother has come with a contingent from his homeland. And the first question Nehemiah asks him is, how's the city of Jerusalem? How are its walls? What's happening? And his brother said, Nehemiah, you don't want to hear it. But its walls are in ruins. Its gates are badly burned. The city is in disarray. Four months later, this conversation takes place as the king looks at Nehemiah and asks him a question. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought before him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. But so the king asked me, why does your face look so sad? Why, when, when you're not really ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should not my face look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my fathers are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked me, how long will your journey take and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of the trans Euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the king's forest, so he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was upon me, the king granted my request. When your kind pastor wrote to me and asked about coming here, and I knew the challenge of selecting a subject within the parameter of the time slot, I wondered what best could I say in these few minutes that hopefully will accomplish something in your own life and certainly in my own. I want to say to you, for 42 years, I have covered this globe. I was telling your pastor that in the last 10 weeks, I've been in 12 different countries. When you arrive, whether in the body or out of the body, you cannot tell, <laughs> but you're there. You look at your watch and you want to make sure you're looking at the right time zone, and so I have a backup to make sure I'm looking at the right time. And yet every time I return to the soils of the United States, something more tragic takes place, something more daring, something more dramatic, and you say, where is all this headed? So I just want to talk to you briefly how do we prepare? And it's never a simple task. Nobody knows who penned these words. It's credited to anonymity. But generally, they credit it to a woman writer who wrote this kind of poetry, and she put it this way. When God wants to drill a man, and thrill a man, and skill a man, when God wants to mold a man to play the noblest part, when he yearns with all his heart to create so great and bold a man that all the world might be amazed, watch his methods, watch his ways how he ruthlessly perfects whom he royally elects, 
how he hammers and hurts him and with mighty blows converts him into trial shapes of clay that only God understands while his tortured heart is crying and he lifts beseeching hands. How he bends but never breaks when his good he undertakes. How he uses whom he chooses and with mighty acts induces him to try his splendor out. God knows what he's about. So you've got, you've got the challenge of culture and you've got the tedious task of being shaped and molded to be an instrument of change, and it's never easy. I can assure you that the task of a person involved in cultural change is such that he or she would spend many lonely nights and many agonizing hours wondering if there's not a better way to make a living than to be thrust into this kind of role. Nehemiah was in the comfort zone of the palace, and now he is riding a donkey moving out with a handful of mere people in order to rebuild the walls. He made some choices, he took some steps. May I go through a handful of them? The first is this, that he felt the pathos for his people. He felt that burden, that undergirding weight in his own life to do something and to make a difference. And the simple analogy that I draw from it and the lesson I draw from it is this, you will never lighten any load until you feel the pressure in your own soul. You will never lighten any load until you feel the pressure in your own soul. Now that's an easier statement to make. What the challenging part is, how do you determine what it is that you are going to carry as the lot that has been assigned to you by God. How do you select that? How do you come to that? There are so many needs, so many needs. I walked through some parts of the world and I was in one of those countries and we were able to do a, a little bit for a handful of young people for scholarships. And I remember my assistant writing to me and saying, must be so wonderful to be able to give this kind of help to such people in need. And I wrote back, I said, yes, it is a privilege, but nowhere near as painful as how you feel when you walk away from so many unmet needs. You can meet a certain number of them. There are so many you really cannot carry the burden for, and you have to walk away to the priorities that God has set before you. Many years ago, there was a tragic situation in New York. I won't even go into it. It was so bizarre that even those in New York City had not been accustomed to reading something like that. It was a horrendous story. It was during the time when Daniel Patrick Moynihan was uh, 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 holding office uh, at a federal level, and I remember him raising the question, how can so much go wrong in one person's life and nobody be aware of it? How can so much go wrong in one person's life and nobody be aware of it? And, and all of those involved were just stricken to silence. Finally, a city mass councilman spoke up. He said, I wanna ask you this, sir. Do you know what you're asking me? Because this happened in my borough. He said, sometimes my life is so filled with burdens and weights to carry. I don't even know if I'm doing a good enough job with my family at that time. You're asking me how I'm not hearing the cry of every constituent? If you want me to do that, and here's the quote, you may as well ask me to listen to the sound of every blade of grass growing and the heartbeat of every squirrel, the noise would be deafening on the other side of silence. You may as well ask me to listen to the sound of every blade of grass growing and the heartbeat of every squirrel. The noise would be deafening on the other side of silence. A very profound statement. And I say this to you. Isn't it true that your heart and my heart are not big enough to carry the burdens of this world? There's only one place in this world where there's an aggregate of human suffering. That is in the heart of God. And he then takes it into bearable size portions and distributes it. Some of it you will be assigned, some of it I will be assigned. Are you carrying the burden to which God has called you?
And so this civil engineer knew he could build a wall. He knew exactly what it was going to take. And so he bears the burden of his people and he says to the king, how do you expect me to look, your excellency, when the city of my father is in ruins and the gates are burned, the walls have been destroyed. And the king says, what is it you want? He said, I want to go and rebuild it if you will do the following for me and enable me to get there. So the first thing is, he was a burden bearer and carried that pathos for his people. It's time for the average American who loves Christ to start carrying this burden for the nation that we now call as our home. When you see the walls being pulled down, you know, the tragedy is what Chesterton once said, the tragedy of disbelieving in God is not that a person ends up believing in nothing. Alas, it is much worse. He ends up believing in anything. Anything. For decades, I have been on the campuses. And by God's grace, you get on there and every place is packed at uh, Johns Hopkins. They had to open out. The book, the biggest auditorium, had five extra rooms had to open up. Just a couple of days ago at our own NSA, where I was invited to speak in Baltimore. Packed out audience, listening. People are hungry. People are searching. And yet, I never dreamed of the day which happened this year in one of the Ivy League schools where I actually had to go in with a bodyguard. A 300-some pounder African-American walking beside me as my bodyguard and police in attendance outside because of the hostility and the vitriolic language making all kinds of assertions not one of which was ever supported by a quote or a statement from anywhere. I said to my, somebody from Jakarta wrote to me that day, said, praying for you as you go into one of the Ivy League schools in America, reading all the vitriolic language that is in the student newspaper. What's happened to us? Someone has said, first piety begat prosperity, and then the daughter divorced the mother. Walking circumspectly with God, we became blessed as a nation. Now we think we can do away with the source of our blessing. Lincoln warned us it would never work if we did it that way, you know. Bear a pathos for our people. Number two, he prioritized his mission by prayer. His immediate response was one of prayer. This is where oftentimes we fail. We think of all of the activity that needs to go on, and yet the greatest victories are won not when we are standing up, but when we are bent down, when we are on our knees. You know, the thing about preaching and speaking, all of that, it can easily become some kind of a showplace, unwittingly or wittingly, but when you're alone on your knees before God, there is no place for showmanship out there. You are at your naked reality, kneeling before God, and he sees your heart as no one else sees it. You are strongest on your knees. And so what does praying do? Number one, praying recognizes the sovereignty of God. When you begin your prayer and you begin saying, Holy Father, Heavenly Father, Almighty God, however you begin, those opening phrases are a recognition that you are not sovereign over the universe. He is. And so it recognizes the sovereignty of God. The second thing is it enables you to see your heart the way God sees it and leads you to the greatest realization, the poverty of your spirit as I see the poverty of mine before him. For blessed are the poor in spirit. When we recognize that poverty and we see our heart as God sees it. Remember Jacob, how he'd been a conniver, deceiver, cheat, schemer. He'd stolen the blessing from his brother Esau and now had prospered but realized he couldn't live with his own conscience. And so he comes before God in prayer, and he is clinging to God, and he says, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Of all the things God could have asked him, of all the things, 
You know, God could have said, are you truly repentant, Jacob? Are you really in a sorry state now? No. God says, what's your name? What's your name? The reason is, he stole the blessing from his blind father, pretending to be somebody he was not. He pretended he was Esau and stole the blessing. Now he's asking God to bless him, and God says, well, God says, what's your name? He says, you got me. My name is Jacob, the supplanter, the cheat. And God says, because you've recognized who you are, I will change your name. Your name will be Israel. You have struggled with God and triumphed. You have struggled with God and triumphed. When God sees you at that point of you recognizing who you are, that's why I say to you as clearly as I can, the worst kind of sin behind the pulpit or anywhere else would be the sin of pride. I've got a broken back with two titanium rods bracketing me, four clamps, eight screws. I go to Home Depot for a treatment. <laughs> it's unbelievable. You can go through some parts of the world and they are jabbing your back and wanding you. They assure you are not wanted in that country because they can't figure out what's causing the thing to beep, you know. <laughs> when I stand up each time, I know it's only by the grace of God. We're just moving back to a home we've had remodeled. Part of the basement while they were working looked like Noah's time had come. <laughs> so they're clearing all that out. I'm not supposed to be carrying anything, but I can hardly leave my wife to do so much of that. So I'm carrying this big box down the stairways to my study. I've got 7,000 volumes. Carrying one of these down and miss the last step and I'm on my face down, you know. And my wife heard it, there were other technicians and I'm lying there saying, what have I done? You're not even sure you can gain that strength to stand. I've had voice issues, two contact ulcers on my throat. And I say to myself, every message that is preached is another gift of 40, 45 minutes from God. So you recognize God's sovereignty, you see your own heart, and then you realize in prayer what God does for you. C.S. Lewis in his book, Letters to Malcolm, chiefly on prayer, says, they tell me, Lord, that when I pray, only one voice is heard, that I'm dreaming. You're not there. This whole thing is absurd. Only one voice. I'm dreaming. You're not there. This whole thing is absurd. Maybe they're right, Lord. Maybe they're right. But if there's only one voice that's heard, it's not mine. It's yours. I'm not dreaming. You are the dreamer, and I am your dream. Prayer makes you the dream of God. Believe me. And so, pathos for his people, prioritized by prayer, thirdly and quickly, ponders in proximity. He gets close. You're never going to get much accomplished unless you're willing to get close. Some of the most strenuous engagements are amidst the most hostile audiences. Most hostile audiences. And yet that's my calling. I think the most difficult conversation I ever had with my wife on one side, my colleague on the other, was for three hours at the Center for Geopolitical Strategy in Moscow. All atheists in front of me, all of them. It's like a barrage of gunfire. And you walk in there, and then you walk out of there, and then I'll never forget the words of the director of the Center for Geopolitical Strategy. He grabbed my hand, kissed my wife, the back of my wife's hand, and the all faculty are lined up. Their whole mood had changed after the three-hour dialogue. He said, Mr. Zacharias, I'm so glad you have come. And I want you to know I believe what you've told us about God today is the truth. But you know, sir, it's very difficult to change after 70 years of believing a lie. When you get close, you find the opportunity to talk to the toughest of them. And the one who gave his heart to the Lord that evening around dinner with my wife and me was the general in the military there who was my host for those meetings on the open forum. You've got to get close. 
eyeball to eyeball, take the best of their questions, field it. And so, pathos, proximity, prioritizing in prayer, you get to ponder in proximity, and I will have to end, I'll move past two of them, and I just will say how he brought peace for his people. He accomplished his mission. The mission was finished. By the time he finished, he knew how to prepare. He knew how to minister to the families. He got the families to build in front of their own homes, that part of the wall which protected them. Do you see the point? Do you see the point? One of the strongest bastions is the family, and it needs that protection. Under great threat today, but he accomplished his mission and brought peace for his people. And so I just bring it to a close now, and I give you a little illustration from 2,000 years ago. It's a true story out of Fox's book, some book of martyrs. It was an elderly Roman by the name of Telemachus. He loved to be alone about nurseries and flowers and all of that. But all of a sudden, one day in prayer, he sensed an urge to go to Rome. He didn't want to go to Rome. He hated the big city. But nudged by God and of an inner voice, he goes. And he goes into these big arenas where the gladiatorial fights are taking place to his shock. Bloodletting orgies and million, that tens of thousands cheering on. And he wondered what this was all about. In the middle of one of those, he stands up and in that amphitheatrical setting, he shouts out, in the name of Christ, forbear. In the name of Christ, stop this thing. He became a sideshow. And he started to run down the stairs, and the people were laughing at him. He just got into the arena towards one of the gladiatorial participants there. And a voice from the arena came running through, which they did. And as he's bending over, he says in a voice that everyone could hear, in the name of Christ, stop this thing. And the biographer says, many other factors came to bear to bring this about. But the death of Telemachus galvanized the opposition so there was never again a gladiatorial fight in the Roman arenas. It may seem daunting. It may seem unbeatable. But God's looking for a man. God's looking for a woman. God's looking for our young people. God's looking for a child who can say, I'm going to do your work. Can I take a minute more? My grandson, Jude, is three years old. He can talk a mile a minute. Yesterday, he was at our dinner table, and at one point in a conversation, he said, can anyone tell me what on earth we have just talked about? <laughs> he was comforting his mother one day when she was not feeling too good, and he kissed her hand and said, Mommy, I'm giving you some love. Keep it. I'm giving you some brave. Keep it. Next day, he had to go to school for the first day, and he didn't want to go. He's screaming all the way. So as she pulls up by the curb, she opens one hand, kisses him, kisses his hands, and says, Jude, I'm giving you some brave. And opened the other palm and said, Sweetheart, I'm also giving you my love. She said, Dad, I couldn't bear the thought. I pulled over and cried. This was his first day at school little bag over his shoulders, and he's walking and clenching both fists like this, <laughs> with brave in one hand and love in the other. Unless we become like little children, we too shall never enter the kingdom or battle for it. Take the love of God, be brave, and go into the world and be a world changer. The walls will be there. <laughs>